Professor Brendel, thank you so much for joining us oh, at thanks. Big Data. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, it would be great to hear a little bit about what you've been doing, what you're excited about in your lab. Yeah, so, um, you know, my lab, we, we're kind of a, a little bit of a collection of, uh, of interests. You know, we have a lot of different kind of biological questions around human health and disease, and a lot of what the lab does is we, we develop essentially a single cell toolbox. So we come up with different ways to do high dimensional single cell analysis, whether it's immune cells in suspension from a blood draw, or a tissue biopsy that comes out of a patient in the clinic and you know, look at it in a way that we haven't been able to look at before and thus ask questions that haven't been able to be asked before. Uh, and from that data, you know, it feeds into projects in fundamental stem cell biology, immunology, but more recently, you know, as these technologies become more robust and become mainstream, what we've been able to do is start lining up with uh, different clinical trials, clinical studies that are either prospective or retrospective, where we can start to look at these new kind of immune and tissue profiles that we generate and start to line up with how that person actually does clinically, not only get maybe a biomarker of what's going on, but maybe even understand something a little more mechanistic about the disease and how things could be kind of taken to the next level. Mm -hmm. And how has the single cell field really evolved to make this happen? What is it unique about that? That's really allowed these changes to take place. Yeah, well, you know, so I, I think, I think, and I'll, I'm going to give the immunologists and hematopoiesis people a little bit of props. You know, they've been doing single cell biology for three, four decades, right? right. We, we, we know that each individual cell has a different role and a different job to do. I, I guess the, the trick has always been, you know, what are the tools to do this, to do this analysis? You know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is, is, you know, cells are small. And biomolecules that do all the work inside a cell are even smaller or even more rare. And so most of the time we can't measure those things directly. So in my lab in particular, uh, what we've done is we've come up with a suite of tools where we actually use special non-biological mass reporters um, in combinatorial assays where we can measure these reporters in a very sensitive, specific manner. And those are then surrogates for the different, say, regulatory factors, receptors, uh, you know, DNA regulatory elements that we're actually interested in, in whether or not they're governing the function of the cell. And so really it was the evolution of those technologies over the last kind of five or 10 years that have, has spurred a lot of this in my lab forward. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of really getting closer to the clinical space that you mentioned. Yeah, so, you know, it was probably late, 2000, late 2000s, early 2010s when we started to kind of do the first kind of big science papers in these areas where, you know, with a sample from one patient or one clinical biopsy, we showed some interesting insights or showed that, you know, we were seeing real biology. And it goes from, you know, those experiments where everyone holds the machine at one time and the assay works one time to, to you know, get data that, that's publishable to something where I can look at 100 samples from a trial, I can look at them the same way over a longitudinal period of time, and I can compare that data quantitatively and be certain that it's consistent. And once you get something to that point, you can start doing these immune monitoring portal of science type studies. Mm -hmm. And what is kind of one area coming out of your lab, one clinical application that you're like the most excited about. You built this toolbox, but where is kind of the first place? Where are the best places you see it going? Yeah, next? that's that's a that's a really good one. So you mean my lab got our start doing a single cell droplet technique called cytop mass cytometry. That's been really kind of transformational for the blood and the immune system. But more recently, we've adapted those those assays to tissue imaging and actually built all kinds of new instrumentation for actually doing subcellular imaging of antigens on a biopsy where you know, where we might only be able to do one assay at a time normally, now we can do 40 or 50 plex assays. Mm -hmm. And better yet, the technology is, I would say, it's back compatible. And so what we've been able to do with this is we've not only been able to, to do new studies, but we've been able to go and work with the pathology department here, the cancer center, dive backwards into the clinical archive, the CLIA archive, pull old patient mm -hmm. samples that already have years of clinical data attached to them, and revisit them with these new transfer te transformational technologies. And that's, that, that, that's a new platform called Multiplex Ion Beam Imaging that is a, is a Stanford kind of invented technology here. Right. And what is it about the Stanford ecosystem you think that makes this possible? Are there any oh. advantages or disadvantages you see from here? I mean, you know, I would say the, well, okay, I'd say the, the only, you know, the good and the bad of Stanford is it's a small concentrated place. So we don't have the biggest medical center, which means we don't have the biggest studies happening here, but the quality of the medical care because of the, because of the skill of the clinicians here combined with the you know, second to none research environment 
really makes it a great place to do this sort of work. And I can tell you, certainly working with brand new technologies or even inventing a new assay, I can't imagine it going any better than it's gone here. I mean, the university, you know, whether it be cell sorting, recombinant DNA technology, uh, hematopoietic stem cell therapy, I mean, Stanford's always had uh, uh, culture of trying things that haven't been tried other places and the great thing is the university is willing to put an investment in making these things, things happen and they've they've done the same for me and the people I collaborate with at the university here so it's been really phenomenal getting that started. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like this single cell, cell area has really exploded. Where is it going to be clinically in five to ten years? What are you can project out some of the uses and applications you see this happening? Yeah well I mean the you know I think Probably the biggest impact clinically is going to be in the area of immunotherapy. This is actually the session I'm, I'm, I'm uh, moderating here. You know, immunotherapy into itself is a personalized medicine, right? I mean, you don't, there's no generic drug. We have to either derive the drug from a person's immune system or tailor it immunologically to either their specific cancer or the specific immune cell type phenotype that you're functioning. So, so the idea is that you, you need essentially all of this tailoring and all of this characterization, they're all single cell assays. We have, to, we have to image or analyze single tumor cells, single T cells or immune cells and understand what they all look like and how abundant or rare they are in the system. And based on those profiles, we're then tuning what immunotherapy somebody gets. Right. Yeah, no, so be... I think we're going to hopefully go from the research space to the you know clinical reduction to practice space sooner than later. Okay, it'll yeah. be a fun area to practice in in the five to ten years to come. Cool. Th thank you so much. Appreciate no problem. It. Thanks for having me.